Hey everyone, it's Stars here. Welcome back. Hi everyone, welcome to church. My name is Jack. Hey guys, welcome to Encounter. My name is Marcus. Hello everyone, welcome to Encounter. It's great to see all of you this week. Hi Church, welcome to Encounter. It's good to see all of you. everyone. Please give me a hug. Hey church, it's great to have you here with us. Hey guys, welcome to Encounter. So great to see you guys here this week. My name is Todd. You may see me around church, standing there, all alone, needing friends. But please come and say hi, if you are new to Encounter. Oh. Hey everyone, uh, welcome to Encounter Online again. It has been a while, and I don't know how to describe how I am feeling right now because it's been so long since uh, we've done online things together, and obviously this time around things are a bit different. Uh, one thing is the same, we're still in lockdown. Uh, that's why we started this in the first place, and that's why we're here again today. Uh, but so much has changed. I don't know who, who was here um, when, when we're first doing live. You know, I don't know how you can show your hand. Maybe you can look up your emojis and give me a hand raise, that kind of thing. But I remember last time we were here, you know, I have Justin Yao, you know, the famous Yao media setting up the light, the camera, the action and all that. He was setting things up behind the scene and be like, this is the optimum vintage, po vintage point for how you should look the most amazing you can look. And, uh, but now, um, this is just our kitchen. Uh, the reason we're in the kitchen is because this is the only space that we have a safety gate, gate to prevent Aaliyah coming in, photobombing everything, unplug everything as well. So this is a safe space for us, you know, a safe space for us. And, uh, last time Aaliyah need to be held, uh, this time she is roaming around, climbing all over the place. If we're not careful, she might actually climb on top of the kitchen bench and attack us online as well but that's all that's all good uh you know uh, i thought i thought you know let's let's bring the, the <laughs> you know h-u-r h-u-r oh, i'm so funny <laughs> uh back into the church you know uh let, let's let's try something let's get some engagement going on see how this all works i am not sure whether it's just gonna flop very badly or it's gonna work very amazingly so um, you all have your emoji reaction thing, you know. Uh, let's let's try clicking the the ha ha one, you know. It's just just mad click on it and see see if we, if we get this how how this is working. See if we're getting this. 
All right, I see some of you getting my jokes. It's delayed a bit, but it is great. All right, uh, everyone, just try to expand the haha -ha button a little bit. Let me just see that you you know what's going on, and uh, if you want to hoo -hoo -hoo with me, all right. Let's see how how active your fingers are. Right. Let, let's just let's just comment something this time. Comment your street number. All right. We don't want the whole address. We don't want people stalking or anything. Just the street number. And let's see how active your fingers are as you uh, take part in this as well. Okay, I, th I, th I, th I think we're getting the idea. I think we're getting the idea. So my question for you this time is, what was your lockdown craving? All right, something you don't really crave for usually, but the moment lockdown hits, you're just like, I need this food. I can't live without this. How can I survive the next two, three, four days or whatever it is without this food? All right, mine, mine was uh, at McDonald's. I was driving on my way back from a seminar and that's when we heard about the lockdown, everything. I'm just like, I'm gonna get myself a nice fillet of fish just to cap this thing off before lockdown happens. I drove to Yoha's McDonald's. McDonald's was closed, right? I drove to Airport's McDonald's. McDonald's was closed. KFC was open. There was queue over there, but McDonald's was closed. Everyone's so frustrated. I am as well. I'm still craving McDonald's as of right now. So what is your uh, lockdown craving that just happened uh, when, when, when lockdown happened? Let's uh, get some engagement. Let's see what that is going on. It's great. Great. Well, Today, as, as much as we want to give you a sense of uh, worshiping online together, uh, really, I, I, think, I think what I, I feel like God wants us to bring through today as encounter to you is we hope this will create a sense of normalcy. You know, just because COVID and lockdown happens, just because work is shift around, just because church is not in a physical venue, we can still come together to worship our Lord together. So I want to create a sense of normalcy today. Uh, I just want us some, to you know, have some laughter, have, have some connections going on, try to help you engage online. I'm not doing great. Uh, I, I'm just trying all these things as well. But I want to bring in, I mean, we want as an encounter, bring you a sense of normalcy in a life and a time like this. And, um, and, and one way we do an encounter is actually not with all the laughter and hoorah and the hoo 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 that's going on. One way we try to capture this is to just calm our hearts, you know, focus our attention onto the reason why we are here. One thing that we're really big on is to be intentional in encountering our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? To encounter Him together. And we want to take some time to be intentional because you have given us an hour or so of your time each week. We want to be intentional that we're meeting Jesus, that we're connecting to Him and we're receiving from Him. So we want to set our hearts and our minds focus on what is going on. So I just want to invite all of you just to close your eyes. Close your eyes. I know no one is watching you because you're literally in your own place. But sometimes removing other stimulants can help us focus. So I'm just going to invite you to close your eyes. And, um, and, and I'm going to... I'm going to keep my eyes open because I'm reading off a script and something as well. But I want to invite you to close your eyes. Just breathe. Just, just breathe normally. Just take deep breaths into your, into your belly. Take deep breaths in and breathe out together. And let's just be mindful of this space. And even as right now, you might be hearing other noises around the place, you know, other things that's common in your life. Let's just be present in this moment. And I want to share with you from Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. This is a common verse that we all know. So keep your eyes closed and just meditate on these words. That says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Or let's, let's capture it from the Lord. For I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. 
Right? Even at a time like this, just keep our eyes closed. The Lord knows what's going on. The Lord has a plan in all this. And in fact, before this famous verse comes up, God was telling the people in exile in a very abnormal time in their history, a time of exile, God is saying, hey, have some normalcy. Be normal in the abnormal time. God is telling them, hey, I want you to get married. I want you to settle down. I want your children to be married. I want you to plant gardens, build houses, eat from the produce that you produce. Have some normalcy when things does not look normal. Or right? have some normalcy when things don't look so normal. And that's the word from God for us right now. So Lord, we want to honor you with normalcy. As we come to worship, we want to come as if we're physically together with one another. We want to come as if we're just worshiping the same Lord as we would be in a building, Lord. It might feel different, but you are the same. So Lord, let your presence permeate through the service today. Though online, we are together, connected as a body of Christ. So I thank you for this time and privilege to come together as a church. And we just want to lift you up, bring glory to you as we worship. Thank you, Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. So we have Marcus uh, that's going to lead us to uh, worship. And uh, Marcus recorded himself first so that we can join in with him at the time that he did this. And I just want to honor uh, Marcus uh, for his heart and passion behind this. He changed his whole set uh, when this happened. When he knew he, he knew he needed to change, he adapted for it. And we just want to thank you for your servant heart. And church, why don't we just come together and worship together right now? Hello, church. Hope everyone's been settling in pretty well into their second lockdown. I know for a lot of people this has put them out of their comfort zones. And I know for a fact that me doing this is putting me out of my comfort zone, but I just pray that during the set we'll be able to meditate on just how good God is through this trouble. So I've got this verse here from Romans eight twenty eight and it says And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So I just pray that through all this trouble, for all this mess, they will be able to focus on how God is still good. He's good yesterday, today and forever and that no matter what happens, we can just have the faith to know that regardless of what happens, he is here with us and he loves us. So actually let's close our eyes and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, the world is a mess, Jesus. Lord, the world may seem like it's crumbling around us, whether it's here in New Zealand or at Afghanistan, Lord, or just anywhere else in the world, Jesus, there is suffering. Lord, just like it says in Romans 8, we just pray, Lord, that we know that through this trouble, through this mess, through this suffering, Lord, that you are good and all this is working towards your purpose for who you are, Lord, and what your plans are for us, Lord, and help us to trust and that help us to realize that reality in our lives, that, Lord, through all this, you are good, no matter what happens. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Yes, Lord, we just want to come and we just want to say, Lord, that, Lord, we need you. We, we, we Lord, we so desperately need you, Lord. Lord, we, we think we got everything together, Lord. We think we know what's going to happen and our plans for everything. We, we think we, we got it, but God, we, we don't. And Lord, we just want to say, Lord, that you are our captain. Your word is, is our guide, Lord, and that we, without you, Lord, we're just simply so lost. And we need you to make sense of this world. We need you to navigate through this life. But God, we also thank you. We just want to give praise to you because all these are, are, are possible, that, that we can come and we can have hope, that we can have joy, that we can have a sense of peace. When, when nothing makes sense around us sometimes because of you, you are our anchor. And with you, Lord, we know we are safe. With you, Lord, we know our where our hope is with you, God, there is hope. And, and God, we just thank you that as we come together, there is hope. And Lord, I just pray that this hope will just fill us. Even right now, even we're separated, Lord, right now, wherever we are with our eyes closed, Lord, just stir up that hope in us. Stir up that hope that says it's going to be fine, that we will have faith to believe that you know what is going on and that we have the faith to trust in you, that all is well and that your peace, Lord, just come to everyone listening, wherever they are, crying out for peace, crying out for hope, that you just come in and make your dwelling inside of them as they accept you, Lord. And just thank you, Jesus, because all things are possible through you, because you are... You are our ever-present help. And Lord, we just thank you that we can come together this time like this, Lord. And I just thank you for my brothers and sisters online and joining together. Bless them, Lord. Bless them. Bless them, their family. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey everyone, uh, like I, I'm still getting used to this, but hey, can we just uh, get a moment to just appreciate? I think appreciation is so underappreciated sometimes. And just get your clapping emojis ready. And, uh, and I just want us to just, you know, give a appreciation, give some claps to Marcus for just getting this, uh, to, just getting us to worship together online and just with the simplicity of worship, just let's just give Marcus a hand. And, uh, you know, and, and, and also give, just, just give an appreciation and keep clapping for those who have been adapting behind the scenes, that have been making changes behind the scene, um, people who are doing meetings last minute, edits last minute, so that we can have what we have right now, a sense of community, a sense of worship and connection and normalcy. You know, I don't just give a hand to all of this as well. And while we are in that appreciating mood and giving that clap uh, together, why don't we also appreciate the essential workers? 
Amen. They they are, they they need our appreciation. All right, all the essential workers, you know, you know, comment out, give them a shout out, say hey, we appreciate you, we love you. Look after yourself, take care, watch your well being. Don't be overly stressed. Uh, let us know how we can support you. If you know anyone, uh, shout out to them as well. Um, another just a few announcements to make in this place. Uh, we will be back online next week. All right, we will be back online next week. Um, I will be bringing a message. Uh, we've been uh, going on a series of messages that looks at the five common offerings in the Old Testament. We've looked at the burnt offering. Uh, we looked at the grain offering. And next week, we're going to look at the peace offering, or right, called the fellowship offering. So joining again next time, it's going to be great uh, together to see you there. Uh, speaking of events online, uh, we also... Uh, Rice Rally, um, they, they, they're doing it online at, uh, in Auckland, but or is it doing it online because it's not physically in Auckland? Uh, if you want to join in Rice Rally online, uh, just Facebook, search them Rice Rally Auckland. You'll find an event. There's going to be a link there. Just simple details and they'll send you a link to join in on Zoom. You have to go through this process because there are under 18s involved and, uh, and they want to uh, know who is going to be. There. So, if that is you, you're excited about that, that's join in. And right now, if you can join me in with your clapping emojis ready, join in me with in, uh, welcoming Bob, Professor Bob, to be with us. He's going to be our guest speaker today. And, uh, and Bob, um, he is just getting ready, unmuting himself and all that kind of good things. Hey, Bob, can you, can you hear us okay? I can hear you just fine. Oh, wow. Look at that. Technology actually works for us. And uh, that is some interesting setup. Where are you preaching from, from your back background? Uh, I'd rather not answer that question. <laughs> That's exactly why I have a virtual background. <laughs> Well, as as well, we know that you're you're at least dressed from from the from the top half of your of, of yourself. So that is a good. That is a good. That is very very yeah, good. Yeah. How's the how's the household doing right now? Um, it's doing just fine. Doing fine. Just fine. Yeah. How how about yeah. teaching at uh, UC? Uh, you know what? You're really raising a lot of very sensitive topics right now. I'm um I'm actually not teaching, and I prefer that word not to get out. So um, let's just kind of take that out of the transcript. Okay, well, definitely, it, it's, it's out. It's forever deleted from the interspace, uh, whatever we call this kind of thing these days as well. Uh, but we, well, we really thank you for, for coming in. Uh, you have all the reasons to say, nah, I'm not doing this lockdown thing. Uh, this, is, this is whack. I'm not preaching online in this way. But, but you're here, and we just thank you uh, for your commitment to this. And if it's all right, I just want to pray for you uh, before we pass the time to you to share the word to us today. All right, let us just pray for Bob. Um, Lord, we just thank you that, um, we just thank you for Bob. We, we thank you for who he is uh, in, in so many people's lives and, and who he is even in, in the education field and, and his knowledge that has been blessing so many people, Lord. And we just bless him, anoint his mouth so that what he says, what he speaks uh, will be pleasing to you and it will be beneficial to all our maturity and growth. And may you bless the technology, bless the internet, that everything will work out well and that uh, you will be glorified through all this that we are doing here today. And may our eyes be tuned to you, Lord, and you alone. And we thank you for your uh, dear beloved servant, your son, uh, Bob, to be with, here, uh, be with us uh, here today to share your word and we just thank you lord for all this and we pray all this in jesus name amen amen all right bob it's all you now so i'm kind of signing off and i'm just dumping you and leaving you uh in the wilderness to speak to the camera but you're not uh, new to this so it's all you all right well thank you very much and um i have to say i have done a lot of teaching on zoom but i have never given a sermon on zoom and um I was going to pray, but Alan prayed, and I don't want to overpray it. Um, but I do want to say that um, 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 if I if I had prayed, what I would have prayed was that I'm afraid that I'm going to try too hard in the sermon. And um, the reason I'm going to try too hard is because I think the topics that we'll talk about from the Bible are like the most important topics that have touched my life, and the problem with that is that I'm afraid I'll try too hard. 
And so um, uh, I'll try to tone it down. Um, but I, I do want to communicate that I, I love the things we'll talk about. Uh, and so let me go ahead and switch gears and share my screen. Um, here we go. Hopefully you can all see that. Uh, the topic for the today, the title for the sermon is The Offense of the Gospel and the Transforming Power of Grace. And uh, there are two things I would like to accomplish or two goals I have for the sermon today. And the first goal is to give you a new appreciation for how the gospel is offensive, how the gospel is offensive. And the second goal is I want to convince you that understanding the offense of the gospel is the key to allowing God to transform our lives. Okay? So appreciating the offense of the gospel and getting our heads around the fact that that's the starting point for having our lives transformed by God and the Holy Spirit. And if all goes well, and really what could possibly go wrong, right? If all goes well, today's sermon is going to look like this. So it's going to start off kind of black and dark and dreary. I mean, it's going to be offensive in the beginning. And then uh, take heart because there is light at the end of the sermonic tunnel. So, um, so that's kind of the setup for today. Uh, I want to share kind of my key verse comes from the book of Galatians chapter five, and this is the apostle Paul writing. And he writes, uh, now brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. And again, Note that phrase at the end of the verse, the offense of the cross. So I don't know how much you know about the book of Galatians. It is an amazing book uh, for a lot of reasons. It's probably my favorite book in the Bible. Um, and in one of the highlights in the beginning of the book, there's a public battle for the very heart and soul of Christianity. All right? So, so, so it pits two titans of the faith, Peter and Paul, and they have a public thrashing out about what true Christianity, the true gospel, really is. And um, uh, in order to understand that battle, and to, in order to understand why God put that battle in the Bible, we really have to understand what the offense of the gospel is. And so to kind of set this up, I want to introduce you to a little known curiosity called the Indian Cow Dung Festival. So, you know, you might ask, what is the Indian Cow Dung Festival? And uh, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And so let me share a picture with you from the Indian Cow Dung Festival festival. And here we go. There it is. All right, there it is in all its glory. All right, so here's how it works. Um, maybe most of you have heard of the Indian festival of Diwali, and for reasons that we don't really have time to get into today, although they are, are pretty interesting, um, certain villages in India celebrate the end of Diwali by having the men cover themselves with cow dung, as the picture shows. And they smear it all over their bodies, and they roll it in the balls, and they throw at each other. So, you know, kind of think um, like snowball fights, where the balls are brown rather than white. So having eased you now into the topic of dung, I now want you to think about the more common word we use to describe this. And of course, I'm referring to the word shit. Now, what's that you say? You can't say shit in church, even in virtual church? Actually, it's already in church. 
It's in your Bible. No, no way. No way could it be in the Bible. Well, actually, um, uh, you'll see it there in Malachi chapter 2, verse 3. And I, I suspect it may have been a day or two since you were last reading Malachi chapter 2, verse 3. But Malachi chapter 2, verse 3 is where God says he is going to smear shit on the faces of the priests. Yeah, he really says that. So um, um, uh, in doing a little research on that verse, I came across uh, this interesting blog um, that uh, focused on this verse. And it, it comes from a website that promotes or, or has developed a game called Card Talks. Card Talks. You can kind of see it up on the far right of that slide. Um, and uh, it's a very interesting website. You know, I don't say you go there now, but you might want to wait to the end of the sermon and check it out. And this website is a game, and it's a game for good Christians. And I don't know if you can see it under the title, A Game for Good Christians, but it says, the only Christian game not afraid of the Bible. And the reason it says that is because there's a lot of things in the Bible that, you know, offend our sensibilities. They're impolite. They're, they're awkward. They're, they're embarrassing. They're gross. And, and we don't typically talk about them very much. And um, uh, this game uh, actually collects a lot of these really bizarre and offensive statements and gets you to talk about it because it is in the Bible. God put it in there for a reason. And so uh, the game is designed to promote that. I don't know how big selling a game it is, but um, um, it's definitely an interesting game. So I want you to see what this blog has to say about these verses, Malachi chapter 2, verse 3. And first of all, they're going to explain um, their translation of the word shit. And so uh, the actual Hebrew word is the word peresh. Now, Hebrew does not have a big vocabulary. So, and I don't know any Hebrew, but I'm pretty confident that there aren't 25 different words for cow dung. Um, uh, and so, so the question is, when they translate it in the Bible, just how offensive do you want to be? And the guys who developed this game said, really, when you consider the context, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't downplay it. You ought to use the word shit. And so here's the actual context from Malachi chapter 2. Now remember, this is God speaking, right? This is God speaking to the priests. And here's what he says. And now, O priests, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not lay it to heart to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse on you and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them because you do not lay it to heart. I will rebuke your offspring and spread, here's the word, Peresh dung on your faces, the Peresh dung of your offerings, and I will put you out of my presence. And 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 the reason these the the um, guys who write this blog say this should be translated shit is because God is ticked off here. He is really angry. All right, he's not being polite. He's talking to the priests. And he's saying, you know, those bowls that you sacrifice on the altar for me, those bowls, well, well, I'm going to take the shit from those bowls and I'm going to smear it on your face. That's how angry I am with you. Actual website explains it like this. They say God, in sort of elaborating on the verse, says God will dig out the Paresh that was to be burned with the rest of the sacrifice and wipe it on their faces. Why? Because they have turned away from the life-giving covenant. Their actions don't match the words they intone 
before the people, before a God they think is fooled. And then I, I love how they paraphrase it. You may not love it, but I love how they paraphrase this. And uh, here's, what they, here's what they say. This passage is talking about bullshit. That is from the sacrifice, the bull feces, the dung. And sacrifice is when the sacrifices have become bullshit. Okay. So, um, so there we are. There we are. So are you offended yet? Have I got you in an offended mood? Because I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. I want you to put your head down wherever you are. And I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to think. I want, I want you to think of somebody near to you. And I don't want it to be general. I want it to be a specific person. A specific person. I want you to see the face I want you to picture that person uh, right in your mind. And here is the mental image I want you to have in your head. I want you to think of that person totally, completely, 100% covered in dung, covered in shit from head to toe. Now that is disgusting and gross. And I'm going to guess if that was the case in real life, you would be revolted at the sight and smell of that person. And you would want to get as far away from that person as you possibly could. All right? All right, you can lift, you can open your eyes and pick up your heads. So um, assuming you haven't logged off already. So here is the offense of the gospel. Are you ready for it? That is how God views you or viewed you before you became a Christian. Theologians call this the doctrine of total depravity. And as far as I can tell, Christianity is the only religion in the world that teaches that every person, when they are born, comes into this world characterized by total, complete sin that God finds repulsive. No way, you say. No way. That's not how God views people. That's not what the Bible teaches. Well, <clears throat> let me remind you about the living arrangements. When God first came to dwell with man after the Garden of Eden. After Adam and Eve were ejected from the Garden of Eden and before the exodus from Egypt, God lived separately from people. And I'm using the word lived here loosely, I understand, but still, uh, God lived separately from people. But after he led the Israelites out of Egypt, he told them that he would live with them in their midst. And he instructed them to build a house where he would dwell. And I think it's really illuminating to look at what that house looked like. Okay, so here's a picture, all right? Um, and then here's another picture. The artist depiction. And what you want to see is that uh, God's living arrangement had a number of very key features. First of all, God's house was separated from the camp with a white linen fence. All right. And um, the Israelites were allowed inside that fence, but they, there's only one door you could go through. Right. The door right over here in the far right could go through that door, and the first thing they would see is this huge altar where animals were sacrificed. Animals were killed, and the blood from killing those animals served to make the Israelites ceremonial clean before God. It's as if 
they were temporarily, their sins were temporarily covered, as if their sins were temporarily washed away by the blood of those sacrifices. The next thing you want to see further in the enclosure is this structure in the rear. Okay, and that is the house where God lived. It was called the tabernacle or the tent of meeting. And you can see it's in the rear of the enclosure, away from the door that uh, the Israelites could enter. Now, any Israelite could enter through this gate, but only special people could enter into the tabernacle. The only people who were ever allowed inside the tabernacle were the priests. Okay. In fact, Moses was not allowed inside the tabernacle. Only the priest would, could go there. And inside that tabernacle were two rooms, right? The first room you can see here, that's a room where the priests were rostered in on a daily basis uh, to go in and perform certain actions before God. And you'll see a lampstand there. You'll see a table with bread. You'll see an altar where they burnt incense. And um, on selected days, specific priests would go in and they would, they would minister to God. Okay. But, on the, but, but in this tabernacle was a second room. That second room was called the Holy of Holies. This first room was called the Holy Place. The second one was called the Holy of Holies. And inside the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant was a golden seat or a golden cover known as the Mercy Seat. And it's here where the presence of God dwelt, where the presence of God lived. And only one person could enter within the thick curtain into the Holy of Holies. And that one person could only enter once a year. And when that person entered, that one person entered once a year, they could only enter after going through a rigorous regimen of washing and sacrificing and putting it on, putting on new clothes, special clothes. So let me ask you, what is the message God is sending about? about being close to people when we view this living arrangement. I don't think it could be any clearer, right? It's, 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 um, um, it's as, well, <laughs> let me kind of recap here. In the Garden of Eden, God fellowshiped with Adam and Eve. But after they sinned and were ejected, man became sinful. It's after the fall, it's like people became radioactive to God. And so he has to put in walls and restrictions to keep people from getting too close to him. Right? Isn't that, isn't that clear from the way this is all set up? Why is that? Because God finds people's sins repulsive. Now, <clears throat> And you might come back and you might say, hey, hey, that's the Old Testament God. That's the, that's the Old Testament God. That's not the New Testament God. That's not how Jesus feels about people, is it? Well, now, I'm going to show you a verse. And if you've ever read this verse from the New Testament, I'm going to, wonder, I'm going to ask if you've ever wondered what the heck is going on with this verse. Right? This verse is from Matthew. Uh, but you'll find it in the other Gospels as well. And uh, it, the context here is Jesus has, has just uh, had a, an amazing experience with uh, the, called the Mount of Transfiguration. 
with um, um, with Moses and Elijah, and he, he comes down from the mountain, and his disciples have, have screwed up. They have screwed up. Uh, they were tasked to taking care of some things, and they didn't do it right. And so here's what Jesus says. Now, get this. This is Jesus speaking. You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? What is going on here? Is Jesus having a bad day? Did he wake up in a bad mood? Right? What's going on here? Well, let me suggest that what's going on here is that Jesus is expressing the ever-present feeling in his heart of being a holy God in the midst of sinful people. Okay, now, <laughs> put your heads down again and close your eyes, all right? So put your heads down, close your eyes. I want you to, I want you to do some more picturing. I want you to think of the same person you thought of before, uh, totally covered with shit or dung, if you will, from head to toe, revolting to smell, revolting to look at, revolting to touch. And now I want you to picture Jesus Christ walking towards that person. And you know what he does? Jesus takes that stinky, disgusting, revolting person, and he wraps his arms around them. And he hugs them. He hugs them. And as he does that, all that shit smears onto him and covers his own body. Now, what is your normal reaction when somebody hugs you? Assuming you're somebody who likes hugs, and I've learned some people don't. Assuming you're somebody who likes hugs, it probably makes you feel good, but it's not like, you know, it's amazing. When somebody hugs you, they are showing you, they care for you, and that's a normal thing to do, right? I mean, you're a nice person, you've got some good qualities, it's perfectly appropriate for somebody to come and give you a hug and show that they care for you. But suppose now, suppose now, suppose you were totally covered with shit and somebody walked up to you and hugged you. My friends, that is true love. And that is the love of God. We cannot appreciate the depth and the height and the expanse of God's love until we first appreciate how repulsive our sin makes us before the infinitely holy and righteous God of the universe. And that is such a huge point. Let me say it again. We cannot understand how great God's love is for us until we first appreciate how repulsive we are to God because we are totally corrupted, are totally sinful, and he is infinitely holy and righteous. All right, you can uh, open your eyes again and, and uh, pick up your heads. And, um, and there it is, my friends. There it is. That is the offense of the gospel, that we are that repulsive. The Bible tells us in no uncertain terms that there is something fundamentally wrong with us at the core of our being. We are sinful and ugly. And there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that we can do about it. We are too far gone. We are too hopeless. We are too sinful. Understanding our true sinful state is key for understanding why we need a Savior. It's the key for becoming a Christian. 
And I also want to argue it's the key for our lives after becoming a Christian. So let me first ask you this. Is it correct? Is it biblically accurate for us to think of ourselves, if you're a Christian, as being totally incapable of producing anything good on your own? Let me ask that again. If you're a Christian, as the Bible teaches, that you are totally incapable of producing anything good on your own. Is that biblical? Is that scriptural? Well, here, here's what the Apostle Paul says about himself, his own life, after he became a Christian. Here's what he writes in Romans chapter 7. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Let me read that again. I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. So this is the principle I have discovered. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in my body, warring against the law of my mind and holding me captive to the law of sin that dwells within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Wow. This is Paul speaking, the Apostle Paul. And he is saying that he is completely incapable of producing anything good in his life in the flesh in his own power. And if that is true for Paul, it is assuredly true for Bob Reed. And if that is true for Paul, is assuredly true for you. It is really important that we understand and embrace this. And so I'll say it again. We cannot produce anything good on our own because we are inherently sinful to the core. Or to use an offensive analogy, and obviously the theme in today's sermon is offense, to use an offensive analogy you cannot make a beautiful work of art out of a piece of shit. I told you we start off kind of dark and dreary and black, but there was light at the end of the tunnel. So let's kind of, let's move along the tunnel here. So after painting this picture about our natural spiritual condition, the Bible then announces amazingly good news. While you cannot and I cannot make anything beautiful out of our lives, God can. Not only God can, not only can God, but He will turn us into truly righteous people. He will make a new creation out of our lives. Here's what it says in 2 Corinthians. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And you might ask yourself now, okay, so what does that new creation look like? What are the characteristics of that new life in Christ? Give me some description. And that's what Paul does in Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what a righteous person looks like. Now, have you ever wondered why Christians aren't better people? Have you ever been discouraged by the actions of other Christians? by the lack of love, 
the lack of kindness, the lack of genuine goodness? Have you ever been let down by Christian leaders whose lives don't match the words that they speak? Have you ever been bummed out with your own life? Let me suggest one possible reason for this state of affairs. That we are trying to do in our own power what can only be accomplished by God supernaturally through faith. And how does one do that? Isn't that that is, that is a sixty-fourth thousand dollar question? How does one do that? And let me be perfectly honest with you. I, I do not understand this subject very well. But I do know one thing, and I and I am confident of very confident <laughs> of this next thing I'm going to say. This starts. This transformation that the Bible talks about starts by appreciating our true spiritual condition of helplessness, of recognizing that in the flesh, absolutely nothing good dwells in us. Now think about that. Think about how different churches would be if Christians truly grasped this fundamental fact. There would be no basis for judging other people. There would be no arrogance, no pride in what we had accomplished. No looking down on others who didn't meet our standards. We would have sympathy and empathy for the struggles of others. We would be caring and supportive and loving. We would reach out to those less fortunate than us, recognizing that there, by the grace of God, go we. Churches would be amazing, beautiful places. They would be shining lights in a dark world. And here is the really cool thing. God says, that he can do that, that he can transform people to be like that. But we have to be willing to let him. Now, why did I, why did I want to give the sermon um, today? Because, uh, because I think we, as a church, and I'm not talking about Christ Church, Chinese Church, or Community Church specifically, but the church as a whole, the church as a whole, I, I think we've lost sight of the true gospel. The church has become a social club for nice people. And there's one thing the Bible teaches. The church is not for nice people. The church is for people who are broken and ugly, and useless, and sinners. Because those are the only people who recognize they need a Savior. The gospel is offensive because it reminds us that we can do nothing on our own. But the gospel is also amazingly good news because it tells us where to go to get fixed. So I'm going to ask you to put your heads down again for one last time. Okay, put your heads down one last time and close your eyes. If you're here today online and you get it, you can see that you are a sinner who needs a savior. And you have never trusted in Christ to clean you up and replace your ugly sins with his righteousness. You can do that today. 
but everybody has their heads down and nobody's looking. Ask yourself if that is something you want to do. And if so, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to signal that by raising your hand. So raising your hand is a, is a signal to yourself and a signal to God that this is what you want, that this is what you need, that you know that without his help, you can never go to heaven. You can't get there. And you believe he died on the cross for your sins. And you need, you need his forgiveness. That's the feeling you have in your heart. I'd like you to raise your hand right now. Raising your hand is a tangible signal to God and to yourself that this is what you want. Right now. Nobody else is looking. It's a private transaction between you and God. I'll give you a little bit of time to think about that. Obviously, I think it's a really, really important decision. Most important decision you'll ever make. And if that expresses your heart, raise your hand. All right, so you, you can put your hands down, but but please keep your keep your heads down and your eyes closed. And um, um, I would like to say that even though that's a a um, um, private decision, uh, at some point, if you did raise your hand, you should talk to another Christian to let them know about that. Maybe Minister Allen, maybe you know one of the leaders in, in, in your group, maybe just another Christian that you know, uh, and let them know that you made that decision. Uh, why? Because there are things a person can can do to to help help them grow. Uh, there are things they can learn to help them grow in their faith. And so um, uh, if you feel comfortable, uh, you should tell somebody. And if you don't feel comfortable, that's cool too. I mean, this is a private transaction between you and your dad. All right. So, uh, and if you, just, if you didn't raise your hand and, and uh, you're not a Christian and, and sometime later this comes back to you and, and you think about it and you say, you know, uh, uh, that that's really what I do need in my life. You can always just just talk to God in prayer, and communicate that to Him. Okay, so 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 one last thing here, and now um, I want to talk to the Christians, particularly those Christians who are frustrated with how little spiritual change they have seen in their lives since becoming a Christian. Now, there are a lot of reasons why change doesn't take place, but one possible reason is that you have never really appreciated how helpless and incapable you are of being a righteous person until now. You now see that this is not something you can do in your own power. You now get this. And you are sorry that you ever thought you could do it. You are sorry that you fail to realize that the depth and the power of your sinful nature. And now you recognize that your only hope to be transformed is if God changes you. And if that expresses the feeling in your heart, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Again, with your heads down, eyes closed, raising your hand represents a decision on your part. Signals to God, signals to yourself that you've made a commitment that going forth from this day forwards, you are going to depend on God to make changes in your life. You know you can't do it on your own, and you really, really want to change. You don't want to stay that person that you are right now. And if that expresses the feeling in your heart, raise your hand. Think about that. Think about where you are. Think about where you want to be. If that is the feeling in your heart, raise your hand.
All right, you can put your hands down now. We got one last thing. I just want to close in prayer. Um, um, I hope somehow Holy Spirit was able to take some of these words and um, uh, help open up our eyes to see what's in his word. Word of God is an amazing book. So much truth, life-changing truth. And I pray that, um, that you were able to see some of that today. So let's close in prayer. Dearest Father God, you have seen these precious people raise their hands. You've seen what goes on in their hearts. You know their hearts. You know what they want. And we ask you now in the power of the Holy Spirit that you would make miraculous changes in their lives. Glorify yourself by changing us. Glorify yourself by transforming us and make the changes big so the world will know what you can do. We pray these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. why don't we just take a moment and uh, just really capture and appreciate what has been shared, what has been said. Um, thank you, Bob. I, re I really like uh, what you have talked about, especially the idea that uh, we really need to capture. We really need to capture the sense of that we can't do this on our own. You know, sometimes we, you know, the, the, the Christian movement had had, had been over glorified in a way i don't know if we really can but over glorify that or, or, or over emphasize that you need a relationship with god and that is so so true we need that relationship with jesus but but what does that relationship looks like sometimes we leave that interpretation to to ourselves that that we think of our relationships with people and we think this is how it should look like but but actually, God has been very clear that there is a fundamental element to our relationship with God that is actually a dependence on God. That is actually in an understanding of that in His grace, then we see a transformation. It is not just a, a transactional relationship of me still sitting up and where I am and just, and just say, yeah, I have a relationship with Jesus, but not really sensing a need to depend on Him. And, and, and church, I just really hope that you capture that because I think sometimes we we forget we we forget that in a relationship there there has to be an element of vulnerability, and vulnerability comes in when we are willing to open up and own up our weaknesses, uh, uh, and especially to, to to God in this sense. And I, and I just pray that the Lord will just really speak powerfully in your life through this message that now you have captured more clearly just how bad the situation is without God, right? Just, just, just how crap life actually is without God. Just the, the imagery of that, of that shit, I, I can't get used to using that word, covering you. But then how Jesus embraced all that and, and just translate that into actually how much we do need to depend on God to go through our everyday life. You know, I always, I always say, you know, if you, if you don't need God today, you just don't need God. You know, what is the purpose of trusting in God when we don't need to trust in Him? And, and realizing we need God has to come from a fundamental place. It can't just be a material thing. That's good, but it can't just be from that. It has to come really deep within and saying, God, I can't live that transformed life that I always wanted without realizing I need you. So I uh, was just church. Why don't we just thank Bob again and just thank him for bringing that message and just that realization of how much we need to know that we need God in our lives. And I, and I just want to join together in praying. I just want to pray uh, just for Bob and just what he had brought to us today. I want to pray for all of us as well. And let's just uh, join our hearts together and let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we call you our Father because that's the first thing we need to realize that as a child, we depend on you, that our lives our living is not possible without you. And Lord, I just pray that you give us 
a, a, an appreciation, a realization, and an understanding that our living is dependent on you. And without you, Lord, we're not living. We're not living the life that you have brought us. We're, we're just we're just going through life as we wanted to, Lord. But I pray, Lord, you capture, you help us to capture the, the desire to live, to truly live by depending on our Father, Lord. And Lord God, I just want to pray for everyone today that has been convicted in their heart because they have not yet realized the situation of sin and how 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 serious it is and lord i pray that as they capture that they found grace that looks so much more beautiful right now than just a concept in the past that they captured it and that lord that we truly rejoice that we get to have a relationship with you that we get to call you our father that we get to trust you and depend on you in all things because you bring every good gift every pleasing and perfect gift comes from above it comes from you, our Father, and you're not changing. You're, 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 you're the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And Lord, I just want to thank you for this reality. And Lord, we just want to thank, uh, thank you for Bob, who is such a friend to, to, to encounter, Lord. And he has always been uh, on a support, uh, whether we know him personally or not, Lord, Lord, he's been praying for us. He has shed tears for this ministry, and he has been really a true friend uh, for this congregation and for, for this body as well. And we thank you that we get to have uh, this amazing, uh, amazing man of God to, to journey with us in so many ways, to share in a relationship with us in so many ways as well, Lord. So I pray that you bless him. I pray that you bless him and you bless Dave and, and just their family, Lord. Bless them with great health, Lord. Bless them with, with, with just continue to be so motivated by you and your gospel, Lord. And I bless them. I pray that you bless them with, a, with an impact through their passion for your gospel, that people will know your word and that they will come to know you through their faithful living and understanding how much they need you in their life. And Lord, I just want to pray for all of us. Bless our week ahead, that we will walk in your way, that we will depend on you. And even when, it, when we find hard to love one another in this time, in the lockdown period, Lord, we, we come to you and ask for that strength, that love, that care, that compassion to then show kindness to the ones around us as well. So Lord, we now pray that the, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit, you of each and every one of us, from now on, forevermore. Amen. Church, I'm just so excited to have you guys here, and I hope that you had some takeaway with you. You know, my personal takeaway is just to really capture just how much I truly need God, like live my life in the daily dependence of I need Lord, I need you, and actually set my life with a, with a focus and a purpose and a mission of God so I cannot accomplish without him. So that's my takeaway. And I hope you have a takeaway uh, from this message today so that your living will be transformed by the grace of God together. So uh, before we close, just want to encourage you, if you want to join Bryce Rally, uh, go search up the details online right now. And um, actually, we, we always have after service hangout time to play board games. If you're interested in that, and you know who Marcus Sim is in our church, go message him and be like, hey, what's up? Is there anything going on? And uh, if there is, uh, you know, just, just do some things. I, I don't know what people do online these days, uh, but I hope to join, see you guys uh, Rice Rally, or I'll uh, see you guys next week right here at Encounter Church Online as well. So see you. Goodbye. Have a blessed week. And we shall see you next week. Bye-bye.